So we look forward to this evening and then to the uh, conversation that Glenn will have with you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for the welcome and it's good to see you all. Really nice. Uh, thank you for coming out this evening. Um, yeah. So this is a book about theology of religions. It's, it's a sort of story is that uh, back in 2010, uh, my PhD became a book. Um, it's the one on the, on the left there that um, my daughter's um, uh, babies are reading. Um, um, and then that was reviewed by different people and some of those reviews were nice. And one of the people who wrote a, a nice review uh, went on to sort of involve me in a, in a project uh, that was related to this. And then ultimately he asked me to, to contribute to uh, Brill, the publisher. Brill has got a series of, uh, of research perspectives in a whole wide range of, of areas to do with theology and philosophy and law and all sorts of things. And they've got asked people to, to summarize the state of play in, in particular fields and so I was asked to do it in this field of theology of religions which I'll explain a little bit more uh, about as well. But yeah there are some copies at the back and uh, you're free to uh, write your name on a list as well if you want to order one at the uh, um, delightful price of um, £41 plus post and packing um, uh, because they come from the Netherlands. Um, is that enough explanations so far? Are you with me so far? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so theology of religions is a bit of a guilty pleasure for me, I think, um, because in many ways it feels absolutely crazy. Uh, it, it feels like a sort of crazy area to, to be playing in, because it's so speculative. It's, it's people who who almost haven't got anything better to do, trying to make sense <coughs> of the whole range of what's going on in religion and thinking that we can, we can sort it out. You know, how audacious is that? Kind of the nerve of it. Uh, so it's a bit of a guilty pleasure uh, trying to make sense of all that religious diversity. And to make it worse, of course, it's not only trying to make sense of that religious diversity in itself. What do I do with Islam? What do I do with Buddhism? What do I do uh, with Christianity itself? But also, of course, there's diversity within a religion in, in that in that whole field, how you know, Christians do not agree on how we should make sense of that diversity. So it's working at two levels of, di of diversity st to start with, religions themselves, and then the variety of views within a religion. Um, so, I mean, as, as someone put to me, you know, that actually to, to be playing in this field where we're trying to make sense of two levels of diversity at once, you have to be a little bit smug, because um, you kind of think you can sort it out. Um, but I confess, I, I quite like playing in this field, at least some of the time, uh, for two or three reasons that, that kind of play to, to, to how my mind works. Um, the first is that I'm actually quite systematic in how I think, that my desk doesn't look like it. Um, but I actually quite like the idea of putting things into categories. I actually find that quite a helpful way uh, of going about things. Um, I, I, the presumption that, that it is possible is, of course, a bit... Um, um, cheeky, uh, but I, I like the idea of, of comprehensive categories. But then there's another part of me that is messy, and um, and that especially loves messing with other people's categories, because uh, that's 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 really fun. Um, I'm doing that for two reasons. One is because there are conceptual problems with other people's categories that don't always fit, and there are political problems with other people's categories. There, there's always a sense of injustice when people try to put people into into boxes one way or another. So, uh, so I like being systematic, I like messing with other people's categories, um, both on the issues of truth and on the issues of justice. So it's quite a, a fun sort of subfield of theology to be playing in, um, even if sometimes it feels a bit inconsequential. What's the point of that? What does it actually uh, bring about at the end? And so I try to kind of keep in mind that actually I do have an aim here. I do have a, a desire that I want to come about, which is that uh, I hope more and more of us will become that little bit more um, alert to the sheer awkwardness of religious diversity. Um, it's not easily categorizable, uh, and the more we appreciate that, that actually might be a good thing. Uh, and the second thing that I, I, I hope we might 
grow into is that while trying to kind of live with the sheer awkwardness of diversity, that we might be a little bit more gracious towards one another while living with that diversity. So the task that I was asked to do was to um, survey the field of the theology of religions, uh, which is how within one religion you make sense of what's going on in other religions, uh, to identify where there's energy, where the trajectories are going, what, what are the sort of um, movements within it. Uh, and I was told that I could do this from an angle, which is good, because I've got one. Um, <laughs> And to do it in such a way that people in other fields would recognisably kind of get a sense of what's going on in that field. So the idea is that people working in other subfields in theology would kind of kind of uh, read this and get a sense of what's going on in the subfield that they don't play in. Um, they didn't specifically say this. Uh, include a Venn diagram to make it slightly more interesting, but I, I like doing pictures or things occasionally. So there is, there's a page uh, in, in the book with diagrams. It's not all text. Uh, as, um, uh, yeah, that makes it slightly more interesting anyway. Um, but I do have this sense that um, when I'm playing in this field, and I'm, I'm talking those terms on purpose, that actually it does feel a bit like play. Um, because it is speculative, we're trying to make sense of it and, and kind of, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit daft, it's a bit silly to be kind of make, thinking that we can sort all of this out. Uh, so I'm playing, um, but I'm always slightly conscious that I'm trespassing in a field where other people are the experts. Because in a way, although this is an area I teach, it's not where I get most energy, it's not where I feel I belong most of all, that's much more to do with political theology, empire sorts of things, and uh, particularly the work of one theologian that one or two of you will have heard of before, um, Andrew Shanks, who appears in this as well. Um, so I always, I always feel slightly as though I'm playing in a field where other people spend all their time in it. Uh, but that actually became quite a, a helpful metaphor for me, thinking about what it means then to write in this area. Because it, I realised that... Um, while I'm not always at home in this field, I want to be in another field, doing, playing other sorts of games. Um, that's actually quite a helpful way of thinking about what we're doing when we think of other religions. We are always, to some extent, trespassing in other people's fields. So to actually do it cautiously, to actually do it with some sense that this isn't my home turf, this is someone else's, means that maybe they've got something I need to learn from them about. Of course, also admitting that this isn't the field I most want to play in might make people forgive me for if they ever notice that there are things missing in how I describe this field. Um, but as students probably haven't got so much sympathy with me for that. Because <laughs> all the times we write, you haven't said this, you haven't said that. Um, yeah, but even in half a book, you can, there are still things you, you miss, you miss out, and there are some things I know I missed out from this. So that's the, uh, the task. Um, and there are various outcomes. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but I'll just give an overview of some of the main things that I think I discovered while playing around in this field. Um, <coughs> so, as I said before, there is obviously a range of opinion within one religion about how we make sense of other religions. Uh, and that range of opinion is quite often called a typology. There are different types of ways of thinking about uh, those, those, these issues. Uh, and the typology itself is described by different theologians in different ways. They, they don't all have the same typology. Uh, so some people organise it this way, other people organise it that way. Uh, and so I wanted to play that game as well and see how we could tweak it to make it even better. Um, so some of the things I did and some of the things I discovered were how to make small tweaks to things to see if that helps to clarify some of the issues. And some of the things I did were, were trying to be a bit larger scale. Um, uh, how has this whole field missed, missed the point? Oh, this sounds so cheeky, isn't it? But, um, 
so some of the small things I uh, identified were that um, in the typology, one of the common words that's used is exclusivisms, the idea that people within one religion look at other religions and say that it's only our religion that has the truth and has the, the saving power, so it is exclusive. Uh, and I, I wanted to use a slightly different term for talking about that, um, theologies of discontinuity, to, to get across the idea that there is there is no continuity between this religion and other religions. It's only within this religion that certain things go on. But um, the, the problem with the word exclusivism is that it often sounds quite pejorative. It's not the term that people within it would have chosen of themselves. It's um, you are exclusivist. Um, whereas theologies of discontinuity is a little bit more kinder as a term, I think. It's something that people could own. Um, and it's, Inclusivisms is the, the viewpoint, largely speaking, where you say um, there's all these religions. Our religion has what really does the business, um, but those other religions have it in a pale, a paler version. And so we can kind of incorporate them into our tradition on the basis that they are implicitly doing what we're doing. But we see it best, they see it partly, but we can still bless them and assimilate them into our, into our uh, world view. Um, I'm not sure, maybe assimilation, maybe I've been a bit too harsh there because that obviously is a word that does have um, uh, negative connotations, but it's, it is the idea of, of, of trying to be all-embracing and, and include the others within your way of seeing things. Pluralisms um, is, is broadly the idea that there are many parts, there are many ways of going about this religious activity and that they are valid. Um, and I've, I've chosen to use the word theologies of receptivity as a way of speaking about um, this. Pluralism, there's a lot of misunderstanding about pluralism, especially by pluralists. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and, and very, very sort of simplistically, my biggest problem with how pluralisms sometimes portray themselves is they say all religions are equal. And to me, it's really hard to reach that conclusion because that presumes that you can sort of step outside all religions and add them up in some way and see whether they all reach the right sort of number. It's actually, how, how do you, if, you're, if you're in a religion, how do you determine that they should measure their religion in the same way that you want to measure religion? It's actually quite a hard thing to do. But, well, so it's not so much, to be pluralistic isn't so much about deciding they're all okay, so you've reached the conclusion. It's more a way of being. It's a it's a mindset. It's a it's a it's an approach. It's it's an act of receptivity, believing that they have things that you might receive from them. So it doesn't mean you know, to, to, you can affirm all sorts of things about other religions and believe they have things to teach you without you then having to go on to conclude. Therefore, we're all equal. Uh, so it's possible, I think, to be a pluralist and believe that actually your tradition is best in certain respects while also thinking that you might receptively recognise that another religion is better in other respects. That doesn't mean you can therefore reach a conclusion where they are all neatly sorted out, uh, but that you are being receptive to what each religion has to say. Does that make sense? Uh, just to make it a little bit more complicated, um, there are two kinds of pluralism as well. Um, there might be more, but... Um, one is what someone calls superficial pluralism, which is to say that actually you don't really believe the diversity runs very deep. You believe the, the, the differences are actually just superficial. If you scratch away at the surface, you'll find common ground amongst religions quite quickly. And so it's very affirming of each other on the basis that we're all doing something broadly the same, aren't we? Whereas deep pluralism says, actually, no, the, the differences are much more awkward than that. They can't be ironed out and sorted out um, so it, it's more attentive to the idea that another religion has things genuinely strange to me that I might learn from. Then there's a sort of family of, of, of other um, ideas, um, particularisms and comparative theology. Comparative theology is more a method, it's more a way of saying, you know, we can't theologize this 
there's Islam, here's Buddhism, you can't sort of iron it all out. Instead, what you need to do is choose a topic, like how does this religion understand love, or what are they doing in their rituals, and you compare them side by side, and you learn from each other through the process of dialogue, by looking at their texts, looking at their activities. So it's more of a method, it's a, it's a way of kind of uh, living and listening to each other. But theology might flow from it. Um, so it, it says, comparative theologians say, we cannot decide the theology of, of these different religions. Um, we must, and so as I'm using the word, we must defer judgment. We must wait until we've done dialogue intensely first. Uh, and particularisms also are deferring making a judgment because they say, to belong to my religion is so distinct but my story is so definitive for me that it's impossible to leap out of it and translate it into someone else's terms. Similarly, someone in another region can't leap out of theirs and translate it into my terms. We're, we're always going to be talking in one way or another across purposes. There's no neat way of, of bridging uh, the divides between us, and so therefore we must defer judgment. We must be faithful and bear witness faithfully to our tradition and let the others bear faithful witness in that. So a breadth, a typology of, of different views that I'm slightly tweaked for language uh, in order to, to emphasise what other people have also said um, to Velas de Sia and Paul Hedges talk about these things more in terms of tendencies than types. Types box people in a bit too much, even when that's not the intention, whereas tendencies say that you, know, you can be a, a, a bit of a sort of theologian of discontinuity and in other ways, in other times, in other moments, in other groups, in other groups you might be more of an assimilator. We, we, we move, we're a bit more fluid, we're a bit messy, and we have tendencies. So those were the um, small tweaks. Okay, all right, so far. There we go. <coughs> the bigger problem, though, is that um, all of this typology presupposes that we know what question we're asking of other religions as to whether they, whether I whether they suit what I want to say about them. Um, are those tradi traditions effective in the way that mine is? It's, it's what's sort of going on. So an exclusivist answers that in a certain way. No, they're not. An assimilator says, well, they might be partly. Uh, pluralist says, well, yes, they are in their own way. Uh, a particular says, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but they're all asking the same sort of question, as though that is the way to understand what's going on in other religions. Here's my particular story. Are they matching up to my uh, particular story? But what if true religion is not so much, or can't be sort of simply um, um, argued about in those terms, but actually using a term from Andrew Shanks is much more about a response to truth as openness, which on the one hand is very, very simple, but on the other hand is, am is amazingly rich and complex. Um, so one way of describing what he means by truth as openness, and we'll come back to this uh, a little bit later on, is that it's the very sacredness, it's the very divinity of being lovingly open to that which is other. If that's the very nature of God, what does that mean then? Religion is, a tr is about being a response to that understanding of God and, and what flows from it. Uh, and that might lead us to kind of see the typology a bit differently. Um, so I talk about um, three dynamics, three scandals going on um, within the, the religions um, and within the debates in the field of theology of religions. Uh, so the first is I call the scandal of particularity, which is how we reckon with our own identity. A, a lot of the debates in the theology of religions are about well, what do we think it means to be Christian? It's not, it's not just about what it means for me as a Christian to engage with Muslims. It's, a, well, how do I understand my Christian story in itself? It's, it's a kind of struggling with, a wrestling with our own particularity in response to that engagement with another religion, but also um, before it and after it. And it's a constant sort of dynamic of trying to work out, <coughs> well, who are we? We say we are faithfully these people. What does, what does that mean? Another scandal is the scandal of plurality itself. 
and the, the struggle of making sense of and engaging with the sheer strangeness, the awkwardness of religious diversity. How, how do we live with it? Um, and then the scandal of universality, um, recognising that actually religion is a bit too small. Religion, so far all of this stuff has been about religion, thinking about religion, thinking about other religions. But actually religion is not just concerned with religion, but it's concerned with the whole world and, and how we might transform structures that divide us from each other and that dominate one group over another. So uh, working for ever greater solidarity. And I'm suggesting that each of these three dynamics is a response to truth as openness. Uh, God is uh, urging us to, to open up to those within our own tradition who don't see things the same. God is urging us to open up to those who are strangely different from us in other traditions. And God is urging us to open up to those who are the victims of structural systems which keep us uh, apart from each other. And so then, in the light of those three things, I suggest that uh, the debates within this field can be organised according to these three things. So it's not so much a typology as looking at it sideways and seeing how that typology spreads itself out in response to these three concerns. This sort of makes sense. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this detail now, I don't think, but just to say that, so within the scandal of particularity, there's, there's different sorts of things going on. Um, but it's to note that we shouldn't take for granted what our own story is, but it is a, a constant renegotiation of who we are as Christian people or who we are as Buddhist people. It's, it's not sort of a, just a given. Uh, we keep working it out. Our, ident our identity is being constructed again and again. Uh, we, we keep working out. We go back to the roots of our tradition and we, we engage with the world as it is in order to tell ourselves, well, who are we now? Um, so our, and so that means that what we think of as particular, what we think of as universal, so we belong within this Christian tradition and we're trying to tell people these, this is universally the case, we might not always have got it right about what's distinctive and what's universal, because maybe it turns out that some of the things we think of as distinctive, other people actually also say it, but they say it differently. And there's some of the things that we think are universal, other people have other sorts of universals that make us think differently about the things that we think are universal. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, isn't it, you see, playing in this field. Um, but maybe I will talk about a bit about this, because this is interesting. So we're not only really talking about Christians, talking about Christians, talking about other religions. But some of the stuff I discovered that I was particularly interested in was how people in other religions also play in this field. So the field was cultivated to start off with by Christians. And then people in other religions said, but you're in that field, you're talking about us, can we play in that field as well? So uh, the field was enlarged, and, um, and it's interesting to see how some of the movements within other religions are starting to think their own identity. Well, what does it mean then to be Jewish in the light of religious diversity? And one of the, uh, one of the things um, that I came across was the idea that there might be a difference between God and God. Um, God and God. Yeah. And that, um, you got it. Um, and they, they, they kind of say um, that the God we often end up worshipping is God, not the real God. It's a, it's a false, it's a, a more limited God. It's not so much a living God as a domesticated God, a God who fits our interests, a God who suits how we want to see things and, and how we organise ourselves. Whereas the real God, um, we've missed. That God is in exile. So drawing on the Jewish tradition in order to kind of account for this gap that we're all li always living, so this is talking Jewish terms, but actually does this carry across to other traditions too, we're living with this mismatch that we think we're worshipping God and behaving according to the truths of God and actually we might be off target. Um, in Islam, um, one of the uh, most interesting areas is uh, Sufi, um, Sufi thought, uh, and Jawad, she identifies how uh, 
Shah is one of the most creative thinkers in this regard and says that um, Islam allows for a unity a oneness and a manyness at the same time uh, and that um, yeah. so that Shah Kazimi argues that um, um, it is Islam that allows for this better than any other religion but it argues that it is the one that allows for God being both one and there being many responses to one at the same time. Uh, not the thing that all Muslims would agree with, but uh, uh, and the, in Hindu tradition, Vivekananda also makes a similar point, but it's Hindu tradition that is best placed to allow for diversity. Uh, uh, and it says that other religions that make more exclusive claims are further down the ladder. So Christianity and Islam are problematic as they make more exclusive claims, whereas the, the more you give up your exclusive claims, you go higher up the ladder, but what's uh, so you can so people can be reincarnated into a higher religion. Um, so Hinduism is a higher religion, um, but they're also saying that all those religions, even if they are exclusive or inclusive or whatever, that they're still faithfully part of the same system, all responding to the same that which cannot be named. Uh, a, a warning that comes from Buddhist traditions is interesting. There's, there's all sorts of schools of thought within Buddhism, uh, but, um, but quite a pre prevalent uh, feeling within lots of Buddhist schools is to be wary of this whole enterprise, because it sounds too much like uh, nice, well-meaning Westerners secretly trying to colonise their space again. Let's have a nice conversation where we can get in, uh, and then suddenly so, you know, Buddhists have been burnt before by this whole process of actually being welcoming to Westerners. And so there's actually a sort of caution from Buddhists that even when you're trying to be nice, dialogue -y sort of people, um, can we really trust you? Um, one of the things that uh, uh, struck me most was the post-colonial insights into this um, and, and how traditions are always negotiating across borders. So Jenny Daggers is a really helpful book by her. And traditions are never pure, they're always borrowing from one another. Um, a bit of chaos theory that I went into as well, because, um, yeah, that, that whole idea that, um, can you organize the boundaries of a religion legally? Can you say, there's the boundary, if you're on that side of it, you're this, and you're on the other side of it, yeah. actually it's a bit messier than that, and chaos is one way of um, helping to make sense of the disorder. <laughs> um, so that's stuff to do with particularity, and then what do we do when we're engaging with that which is very strange to us? Not, no, not, not so much now trying to make sense of what it is to belong to this tradition, but now here I am, engaging at the frontier with another religion, and uh, what do we do with that? Um, and there's a really interesting uh, chapter in a book by Janet Williams talking about dual belonging and how um, to, be, to, be, to belong to two traditions at the same time kind of shakes open this, this whole idea of one identity versus another identity. Actually, um, people can inhabit both worlds uh, and there's a sort of interplay. Then there's the whole question of uh, what I call the scandal of universality, you know, a, a movement and religion has a responsibility to kind of move beyond itself and to transform structures in our world which work against solidarity. Um, and there's um, uh, theologians who talk about religions fostering eco-human well-being. Um, Pieris from Sri Lanka, a really interesting uh, argument by Pieris, that the agency of the poor in all religions, is a mark of God's coming kingdom. So he's sort of cautioning against Christian tendency to think we, we know what, how to make sense of this, but actually, if it's the liberation of the poor and the agency of the poor that is always a key marker of God's coming kingdom, then we should wake up to the fact that most people who are poor aren't Christian. And that, so that their very sort of movement for their own liberation is a mark of God's kingdom. So, the mark, so God's kingdom is outside the church. And, um, that's just a little link here to um, another book, um, uh, Scriptural Resistance, which is on the, also on the table over there. Uh, so I contributed a chapter to that, which is, is working with these sort of more political ideas and how uh, 
in that case, within scripture, there are these competing voices. There are these voices that open us up to that which is strange and to that which is oppressed. And there are other voices which close us down and make us, um, yeah, to, to close down things. Um, and in a way, that's a more exciting book. I guess you're getting bored with this one. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, because it's more political. Um, anyway, just to summarise then. It's a dynamic field with a wide range of things going on. Um, uh, I'm interested in how within a religion we construct our identity and how an identity can be quite fluid in itself, it's not settled. Uh, I'm interested in how we engage with that which is strange to us. And I'm interested in how religion uh, is not just concerned with religion but with the transformation of systemic divisions. Uh, so these are the things that we might assess religion by. And if you're wondering what all, what all that was about, um, um, <laughs> it turns out that religion and reality are both quite complicated. Um, uh, religion, I think, as a response to God, should help us attend to that reality lovingly. And that includes learning from other religions. Uh, but I always have this sort of sense, I think, um, that religion itself is not the be-all and end-all. And I can partly imagine a sort of rewriting of uh, Isaiah or Amos, I hate your theology of religions. Uh, uh, what I really can care about is whether you're transforming the structures of, uh, of division and domination in the world. Um, uh, so, a, a caution to me. That's enough for now. So just thank Graham while I quietly sneak across in my chair. <laughs> I had the good fortune of having a uh, mini sabbatical back in July, which was devoted simply to catching up on some reading that I was determined to do. Um, and honestly, the first book on my list was... Graham's recently published book that we've been hearing all about tonight. Um, give me the power of good. You made me think in ways that I've not thought for ages, so thank you for that. That definitely probably puts me in a certain category because I think there's a typology of the people who turn up to these kind of lectures. <laughs> there are those who hear about complexity and find it fascinating. And then there are others. <laughs> I guess most of us are persuaded by what you've said that the field and reality are indeed complex. <laughs> How's about a word for those unlike me who don't find that level of complexity particularly appealing? Why should people bother reading the um, um, well, religious diversity is big, <laughs> and it's very much on the world's agenda, and, and I suppose some of the things I'm trying to talk about through it are um, that it would be much better, much healthier, much more constructive if our main way of handling this was much more leaning towards hospitality and the generosity of spirit and a willingness to be uh, opened up by those who are strangely different from us. Um, so while on the one hand you know, I was tasked with doing something which was surveying a field, uh, I'm probably more interested in the fact that I'm also covertly arguing for something here, which is that, um, um, yeah, in order to attend to that complexity, don't worry about it as such. Um, focus on the small things we can do to try to be responsive to it, um, receptive to those who are different from us. So you do hope that the book will actually make a difference to how people behave towards people of other religions? That'd be great, wouldn't it? 
uh, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be very widely read, but uh, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I, I think it has that potential to kind of at least inform the debate and maybe inform behaviour a bit. Yeah. I mean, the, the book itself may not be top of the Sunday Times best sellers list no. shortly, uh, but the ideas behind it, I know, will be disseminated amongst people who study here, amongst others that you teach in the places. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm guessing you're kind of not just writing it for the sake of writing it. No. Right? You actually wanted to make a difference out there in the real world, maybe yeah. indirectly through others down yeah. the route. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in that sense, to what extent is the book concerned with theology? And to what extent is it concerned with politics? You were starting to hint that that towards the end there, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so si since um, finishing it, I've been starting to think about uh, what I might do next. And some of the language that has emerged for me is, is partly what I was gradually teaching myself through, through writing this. Um, and I'm particularly taken with the language of empire and that we are living always under empire of one way or another, one sort or another. So it's structures that um, hold people, that colonise people so that even the very things we think of as being possible are limited because of the structures that we live with and so on. But psychologically what's within us, we have an empire within us and we have an empire throughout as well. And that um, that sort of way of thinking holds together for me the religious and the political because um, religion is also colonised and um, the very way in which we make sense of our religion, the very way in which our religion has behaved towards other religions has very much been informed by and, and kind of um, shaped by the whole idea of empire and, um, and so religion is conditioned um, but also has the potential to uncondition uh, and to kind of shake open the, those that that process of colonising and um, and the kind of limitations that are placed on us by how we're supposed to think um, and the boundaries we're supposed to make between us and the other um, and that's a religious problem and it's a political problem it's a religious solution and it's a political solution for things are indivisible. So both. Yes. Let me just shift tack a little bit and try and put myself in the shoes of people who I suspect might be a little bit irritated by this as an approach. And we can probably all imagine folks who might fit into that category. So I'm, I've got in the back of my head somebody saying to me, why is it not enough simply to look at this field of other religions from within the perspective of my own religion, unashamedly, unembarrassedly so, and simply arrive at my conclusions from that perspective without complicating it with all this stuff. What's wrong with simply looking at it as a Christian? Um. <laughs> On the one hand, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, so the, um, the cheeky part of me says, well, it depends what conclusions you reach. <laughs> um, but in one sense, it's more honest to say that how I make sense of religious diversity is from within the tradition that I know. Um, but some of the problems that I think pluralism gets into is that it tries to kind of build a system of, of, of identifying how we're all saying the same or we're all coming from the same place really. And that, see, that's, um, that's also too simplistic. So whereas you, if you come to be faithful to your tradition, I, this I think is a, is a really big question that uh, Christians are exploring in all sorts of ways. Uh, what does it mean to be faithful? Christians and um, the problem is that um, 
when we ask that question, we are always going to be selective with what we unearth within our tradition. So to be faithfully Christian means I must tell other people that they need to be like me. But there are other things within Christianity too. But uh, I, I, in order to be faithful to Christ-likeness, means that I should bless the faith of a foreign centurion, and I must commend the faith of a Gentile woman. And so there are always stories within our own tradition which do not say, you have to become like me in order to know the benefits that I know, but that actually, to be faithful to our tradition, keeps us turning back on ourselves about, what are we in my tradition? And why select those bits of our tradition and not other bits? That our tradition in itself is rich and diverse and complex and not settled. So I'm, I think I'm all for the idea that we should go deeper into our own tradition, but surprise, surprise that when we do that, we'll still come up with different answers because, because we are being informed by things that we don't even know we're being informed by when we do that. So you suspect that if we are people who fully embrace Christianity, that itself will drive us to significant, radical openness to the awkward otherness of other religions. Christianity itself does that to us. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think there is that dimension. And, and I mean, so this, this language of truth as openness, it's what um, Shanks is suggesting, that the very nature of God is, is one that opens us up to that which is different from us. Uh, and, and although he doesn't always use this word as a synonym for it, he talks about the hospitality of God, but it also means the, the grace of God. It's what it means for God to be gracious. It means that God is open to that which is not like God. God is uh, constantly loving and receptive and hospitable to those who haven't managed to be like God. So we should be loving and hospitable to those who haven't managed to be like us. They, they are different, they are other than Christian. And just uh, and then within Islam too, or within um, Buddhism too, they can also be responses to this. But that's not the only thing going on in any religion. I wouldn't want to suggest that this is the only thing going on in any religion and that this is the thing that we should all agree on. But that, at their best, when each religion is being faithful, they are being opened up to those who are different from them. Okay, so, so let, let me check that I'm understanding you. So could, could I then take that and take that even further and say, if God wasn't the kind of God that God is, there wouldn't even be other than God. Mm. God is responsible for there being something other than God. That's yes. creation, creation yeah. from nothing, yeah. creation of God, creation before time. Yeah. And, and that God stands towards that is unconditionally loving. Mm. So there's this which is other than God, yeah. which has its being in God, and God's attitude to that is complete love in all its complexity, all its mm. awkwardness, all its otherness, all its difference. Mm. And, and it's that that we're seeking to be faithful to as Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, have I got that right? That sounds good. Great. Yeah. Well, you read it, wasn't it? <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Um, I'm going to kind of hand over to the audience in just a second or two. Let me bring it right back down to practicalities, if I can. Yeah. Um, so when, when people walk out of here this evening, yeah. <laughs> Practical things in relation to people from other religions ought we to be doing differently because we've been here tonight or because we're persuaded by what we've heard tonight. So let's go away from here and let's do something different. What should we do differently? Um. And in at one level, I think you can be liberated from some of the uh, expectations you put on yourself about how you should be in relation to people in other religions. Because sometimes we think that we should go representing Christianity or whatever tradition we belong to. And that when we encounter someone else, they represent the whole of that other religion. But actually, um, 
they are a version of that religion, you are a version of the religion you belong to. Uh, while there are always reputational risks in any encounter, uh, that people might kind of go, I met Graham today and I don't want to meet any other Christians. Um, <laughs> uh, but actually, what matters most is your uh, attending to their story about what it is to be faithful to, to religion as they understand it. So, um, is this starting to get practical? Uh, take an interest uh, in other people, um, hear their story, and as much as possible hear it in their terms before trying to translate it into yours. I'm going to just step out for a little bit now and hand back to Graham who's going to kind of chair the last 15-20 minutes or so of our time together which is your chance to ask questions. I wonder why we're swapping seats. Do you want to just take a minute and turn to the person next to you and say well, the question that I have is just take a minute to do that while we swap seats. Well, a few conversations have gone on, and it's our chance now to uh, uh, offer reflections, further questions, comments on what we've heard. Grateful to Glenn and go, yes, start us off, start this, us off. This is more of a general sort of question, but I'd like to know what your take on it is, Graham. I remember, I remember that you were speaking in a conversation I once had with John Dick, <coughs> where we were talking precisely about this question of truth as openness in relation to other, other, other um, um, faiths. And he maintained very strongly that the only position one could hold with integrity is to lay oneself perpetually open to conversion, fully open to conversion. Now, it seems to me that while I could see exactly what he was thinking about and the line he was taking and could to some extent sympathize with that, Yet it occurs to me that this is an impossible position <coughs> for any length of time because you're either thrown back, it's a, it's a temp to be open to conversion has to be, in my view, um, a, a sort of pivotal um, state in one's, um, in, in, in one's religious consciousness and you either you can't, you can't, I think, maintain that for any length of time. You have to either fall back into your own, um, the comfort of your own religious home, or else you convert. What do you think about that? Um, so uh, the thing we haven't talked about here is what, how Shanks compares truth as openness with something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this might speak to this. So he. He distinguishes truth as openness, which is the highest kind of truth, it's the very truth of the nature of the divine, um, from truth as correctness. And truth as correctness is a more impatient editing of reality, um, whereby we kind of decide this is the case. Uh, it, 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 and, and to some extent, so it's, it's a propositional kind of truth, it's, it's the more, kind of truth we more normally work with, where we, we argue what is the case. And so on, uh, and but it but it is also sort of driven by a need to make sense of an otherwise too complex reality, so that we we have it edited for us by others who give us the correctness, or we edit ourselves and edit it for others, uh, and and it makes it manageable. And we need things to be manageable. So um, Shanks is saying truth is correctness in itself is not wrong, uh, but what we need is to always kind of. Um, remember that truth as openness is the higher truth. Uh, so truth as correctness does not contain truth as openness. 
of course, how I articulate what truth is openness is. I use correct ways to, to do so. But um, uh, So each religion has its truth as correctness, or each wing of each religion has its truth as correctness. Uh, and, um, and there's something truthful when they do that. Um, and like you say, I think we need some sort of solidarity to organise ourselves to, to live with and make sense of, we belong to this story, this is who I am, I'm, I know I am not that, this is my identity, I'm not that, but I can still engage constructively with it. Um, but I think what Shanks is suggesting um, is that um, we can be faithful to our truth as correctness, most of all by remembering that our capture of the truth is never the whole of the truth, and that we always we always edited it, and that God compels us to open up out of that correctness. But it is, I think, it is always like you say, well, like you say, this is quite weird, but a sort of tension that we're living with. That um, for some convenience, for some organisation, for some sort of sense of this is my community, we need the uh, the boundaries of truth is correctness. But what we should remember is not to mistake that for the very nature of truth itself. Mm. Interesting, yes, so holding together that sort of where you are, but also ready to... Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Stephanie, and then... Let's see. Glad you called there, because that really ties into the question that we were discussing, um, which I didn't have the term in my head at the time, truth as correctness, but it absolutely fits. We need these simplifications, of course we do, but as you implied then, truth as openness is itself a particular proposition. How is it different that you suggest that you are sort of in some way stepping outside by making this proposition? Isn't it itself embedded in a whole set of theological assumptions? <laughs> My brain was kind of exploding trying to get around that question, so apologies if it's slightly strange. No, it's not strange. Um, um, can I break the question down into two bits? Um, and they are. <laughs> the, well, the, the second bit is that, um, yes, of course, how do I know what truth as openness is? I know it as a Christian by belonging to the Christian tradition and seeing it in Jesus as the, the, the exemplar of truth as openness, the one who is shaken open by lepers and people who are pushed out to the edge, who are othered in all sorts of ways. We, so we see someone who is empathetically open, graciously hospitable to all sorts of people. This is how I know that if Christians speak of the nature of God somehow uh, symbolically present in the person of Jesus, therefore this, so I'm, so I'm but I'm, yeah, there's a circular argument, isn't there? That, and uh, there has to be in some ways. So I know about it because of my story, and therefore I'm, I'm, and I'm saying what's at the heart of my story is, is the very truth of things. Uh, so I recognise there's a certain irony um, here. Um, but the nature of that truth as openness is not that Christians have a monopoly on what truth as openness is, because that would then be a negation of truth as openness. <laughs> it is to say that um, the very nature of this one who we celebrate in our tradition is one who opens us up to those who are inconveniently different from us. Um, so it's possible that in other traditions too, there can also be faithful responses to that, where they too are being opened up beyond their own truth as correctness. Um, I'm still deciding that that is the thing to give greatest priority to. Yeah, I recognise that. Um, There we are. Um, what's the second bit? Stephanie was saying more than that. She yes. was saying that that in itself is a proposition. Propositional stuff, yes, that was the other bit. Um, yes. So, Shanks says, for instance, that uh, it's not about how correctly you articulate the nature of truth as openness. That, doesn't, that also would miss the point. Um, it is about being responsive to it, which you can, and you can be responsive to it whether or not you can articulate it. In fact, if you insisted to everyone in this room that 
uh, you have only been converts to my way of thinking if you can articulate what truth as openness is when you leave this room. Uh, it doesn't mean you would faithfully demonstrate it. You wouldn't be faithful to it. You would just know what the words mean. Uh, similarly, faithfulness, um, Christ-likeness, is, is, is not about the correct recital of a series of words, the propositional affirmation of one set of words or another set of words, but is about how in one's life, in one's being, one is being shaken open uh, as a demonstration of truth as openness. And all sorts of people can do that whether or not they have my words. And when I have my words, it doesn't necessarily mean that I will demonstrate it. So, So is this interfaith for the academics? <laughs> or what's the relationship between what you're talking about and interfaith work? Um, so I'm, um, I, I do go to some interfaith um, meetings, some scriptural reasoning things and so on. Uh, um, I confess I've not quite learned how to play the game properly yet. Um, so I went to one where it was a, a new one that was trying to start. Uh, and, but well, I think everyone else there was actually um, faithful members of interfaith groups for years. And this was a new one in a new area. So they thought, well, it will go and support a new one. Uh, and I was really struck by how quickly the conversation was about, well, we all belong to these different religions, but we all agree, don't we? <laughs> so when I tried to do what I thought was a Shanksian thing and say, can we talk about how we're a bit different from each other too, please? I'd quite like to know what you think on this or that. It got a bit tricky. It was got, I hadn't, and I was a bit, so I'm a bit naive. Um, and it was a bit kind of taken aback how people weren't used to that. So, does that mean this is a thing for academics? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, there's a case for saying that interfaith has never quite become a, a widespread movement because lots of the people participating in it have already decided what the outcomes should be and actually. Maybe our world, maybe it would be more practical and transformative if it actually allowed itself as a movement to be troubled um, and to talk about where there's, there are dissonances. And, and I, so, so I said to this group, because they were getting a bit anxious even, I said, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to say let's talk about all the ways we argue with one another. I said, I, I don't want to love you just because of the ways you're the same as me. I want to love you because of all the ways you're strange to me. Um, and that seems to open it up slightly differently. Um, so I, I don't think this is just abstract. Well, yeah, OK, I'm doing lots of categorizing and propositional things about truth as openness, etc. But I, I think actually it has a more meaningful, practical effect. I mean, could it actually shake up interfaith? I think it has that potential, yeah. I mean, uh, Andrew Shanks, uh, so he's recently re retired and, and was, in, was involved in a particularly a Jewish Christian uh, thing over quite a while, and, and, and it was one where people were troubled by each other. It, wasn't, it, was, it was robust. It, um, so I, I think the sort of principles going on here um, are about, I mean, he talks about the God of greatest hospitality, and, and to be hospitable at its best does not mean I want you to feel safe enough so I get to tell you my story. It, it means I want to hear your stories as much as they will trouble me, and not just those stories that are already a bit like the stories that I know, but that are genuinely different. So yeah, I think it has the potential to shake up into faith, to make it go much deeper, to build much stronger relationships, to build a solidarity of they're different rather than those who are already a bit like-minded to each other. Can I 
I sort of ask whether that then builds into sort of mixing with the political? You mentioned that one of the things that sort of empire does is colonize the mind. Mm. Is then this particular type of pluralist approach where you do have this truth as openness and recognize the difference in the particularity? Is that one way of, if you like, counteracting that colonization? Because here's someone else saying, actually, you don't have to think that way. There are other ways of thinking. Yeah. Even if they too are colonized in different ways. At least they're different from yours and therefore it's yes. potentially anti-imperial. I think so, yeah, that's right. Um, um, there's two different bits of that as well. So on the one hand, the, the argument I'm putting forward is quite inclusivist, because it's quite kind of, this is the way in which to, to affirm what's going on in all sorts of religions. So I've decided my, my term, and, and, and inclusivism can continue to be colonialist, because it can kind of say, I want, I kind of, I'm looking for truth as correctness, truth as openness in order to affirm it wherever I find it, and I can bless you on the basis, well done, you, you've got some truth as openness. And that could be a sort of way of uh, colonizing. Uh, um, but I think it is, to the extent that's true, it's, it's also, <coughs> and more importantly, pluralistic, because what it means to be truth as open is, like you said, um, to be genuinely troubled by that which is different from what how I see things. So, uh, um, and um, the, the, the Jenny Dagger's post-colonial book is quite helpful here in kind of saying, cautioning each 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 sort of type, but particularly pluralists who are so well-meaning in trying to find and build common ground that they they don't always see how their own mindsets, my mindset, has been colonised too by sort of let's all be one big happy family, but actually there are power dynamics that need to be continually addressed. And so that's why it's really helpful for me, I think, that the, the third of the things I was talking about were to do with um, religion transforming structures beyond itself and within itself too. That um, uh, Yeah, so where, where are my ideas because of my privileges of whiteness? Where are my ideas because of a sort of liberal cosmopolitanism? And I don't sort of see the power dynamics out there. Yeah, each, each time I go thinking, I've got the answer for you, I, I need to kind of be um, troubled and actually discover that people have been d doing the answer for all sorts of, in all sorts of ways that I've not noticed. I feel the need to speak up as one of the people who's actually done your Shanks module for him. Um, I'm thinking of some conservative friends who are already horrified at my liberal Christian faith and think that I'm on a kind of rapid descent into relativism. And I guess, having done your module, I felt quite smug and felt like my faith was pretty orthodox in comparison to where Shanks might invite me to get to. Um, I guess I, I want to invite you to kind of fast forward into an ideal utopic vision of where we've all managed to <laughs> achieve truth as openness. And I guess my question is, you know, if it were three or four generations hence, would we have any religion? Would there be distinctiveness if we were all so open to one another? Would we not become more and more like each other so that it, our distinctiveness would yeah, peace around yeah. in the process? Um, I think it's going to take more than three generations. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not going to happen anyway. <laughs> Imagine there's no heaven. I feel the sun coming up. Um, um, I don't think he means, and I, I don't think I mean either, <laughs> uh, that diversity will cease. That's, that, that sort of misses the point. Um, so yeah, it's obviously, you know, to be faithfully identified with one tradition and receptive to another tradition obviously does change how you see things. And 
someone in another tradition being faithful to their tradition in and through being open to your tradition also changes them so that there will become more common ground. But it, does, but it, it doesn't mean that the whole territory is defined by common ground. There are, you know, the stories are still distinct. I mean, um, I've, I've talked with Andrew a little bit about how his ideas compare and contrast with John Cobb, um, a, another theologian, who talks about this process of creative transformation. Through, so through our encounter with those in other traditions, we are mutually enriched and mutually challenged. Um, and so it is a process of creative transformation. But he's not arguing for one big super religion where we will all get in the end. It is still very much about um, being to open to each other. And um, I think it's important to hold on to the fact that this isn't relativist. Um, because some things matter more than others. Some things are right and some things aren't. So being hospitable is better than being inhospitable. Being, uh, working for solidarity amongst those who are different from each other is better than working for solidarity with those who are like-minded. Um, so rooting out uh, where each tradition sort of um, closes us down is important to us in order to be faithful to Christians, or to Jews to be faithful to Jews. That, um, so each tradition will be changed, but it's also pertinent for us to kind of help each other see that in another tradition too. We're not kind of being asked to say, I can't say anything nasty about your religion, uh, please don't say anything nasty about mine, but actually it will be quite a, a rigorous, robust, awkward process with some awkward silences as part of it as well. But, but, um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, but yeah, I, I don't think it's one big soup where everything sort of got mashed together. It, it, you still see the distinctive flavours on the smorgasbord of... Is it more of a stew than a soup? Yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Where each ingredient flavours the other but retains its own distinctive flavour. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Can I just follow that up in the next couple of so, uh, I mean, can you can you help me understand what this hospitality and openness might actually look like towards a religion perhaps that oppresses women? What will it look like? And what won't it look like? <laughs> yeah. Um. Which, of course, the Christian religion has done as well. I know, yeah, it's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's such an obvious question, and there's never such an obvious answer to it. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's really obvious or not, but it's, it's, it's the question that um, yeah. Yeah. has most troubled me, I think. And I remember my PhD supervisor asking a similar thing you know, what do you do with the BMP? What do you do with you? In, in, in this sort of um, when you're working for the solidarity, it can also still sound like a nice group of well-meaning people um, who avoid those who aren't nice and well-meaning. Um, I mean, loving your enemies um, seems to be kind of one of the quite powerful, not quite distinctive, but um, how it's flavoured in, in the Christian soup. It's one of the definitive things. So wh what does love your enemies mean? Uh, it doesn't mean they stop being enemies. <laughs> so there are things about those mm. other traditions mm. that you want to illuminate. Um, but it's going to be harder to do that, like you're hinting really, if, you, if all you're doing is talking about where they've got it, got it wrong, it's going to be easy to do that if you talk about where your tradition has had it wrong too. Mm. Um, so that process of rooting out oppression of all sorts of groups uh, goes hand in hand with a constant self-critique mm. as well. 
But yeah, that still doesn't answer exactly. I mean, well, it's interesting. So when I've talked with um, people about this sort of shanked model of solidarity of the shaken, where we are in solidarity with people who are each being shaken open out of our respective truth and correctnesses and our People were sometimes surprised where Shanks has said, but there were sometimes I would draw the line. So, a torturer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, but how can he draw the line? Because yeah. um, you know, as soon as you start drawing the line somewhere, how do you decide to draw it there and not somewhere else? Um, I mean, his answer to that was that, well, there are some things that are so um, against the dignity of the human being like a persistent conscious torturer but yeah what would a meaningful conversation with them to try to understand their story look like mm. but there's still oh, well, well then there are all sorts of other categories of people that you could start saying um i i don't think there are easy answers to this yeah mm. <coughs> um but i suppose one way to help me towards an answer is to say, well, if I flipped it round and said, uh, where, where we have been overconfident about who we shouldn't speak to, <laughs> um, that doesn't help either. Yeah, it's kind of like, I'm not going to talk to all those groups of people because one way or another, they don't see, see things how I'd see things. Uh, but that doesn't get us anywhere. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that doesn't mean that speaking and relating and being open to all sorts of hard people gets any easier but if the world did that more mm. might things be different mm. yeah, thank you thank you Jesse. Mm. Uh, following on from uh johnny's question and it's sort of it's, it's quite short this <laughs> um it's sort of question stroke statement uh, I was just thinking, if we got to this stage in X generations where we were so open to each other of, in different religions and understanding of each other, that our differences, although they were still there, no longer caused any conflict, then surely we must be almost at that final stage of having established the kingdom here on earth. Um, I would agree with you in principle that if things look like that, that might well be the kingdom of God. Um, I think I'm personally a little bit sceptical um, about the extent to which we can achieve it. Ah, it wouldn't be an easy task, no. would it? But perhaps no. one we should be working towards. Always work towards the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's My only sort of question, really, is just a comment. Uh, lens of truth as openness is it's great. I don't have the question or worry about everybody becoming the same because I think that would never happen. I'm, I'm pretty, I think these religions are pretty well guarded and looked after. They are very... I think this for me is an encouragement to be bold, to, you know, to reach out. It makes us better. It makes us better people. But they are so... Reinvents. This A lot of these <coughs> religions, they are so safe. And there's the whole question of culture as well, you know. Culture's got to play into this. Where does uh, openness, you know, stop, and where does respect for other people start? There's all sorts of questions. So I like the fact that Graham said this is messy, uh, but it's great. You know, you, you can do this. It is messy, but I think it's brilliant. I think if we can take anything from this, is to have courage to be open it, for the slightest, if not all the time. Just try to be open once in a while. So you encounter new things. I think that would make you better not more about worry about you know conversions and people moving from one religion because we could talk about this just within Christianity. Forget other faith. Yeah, within Christianity, sometimes we come across as if we're all this 
this just within Christianity, this is a huge problem. And I don't think we can, you know, if we, within the one faith, adopt that, you know, it will probably take us somebody else in generations just to get, you know, to somewhere. So let alone dealing with all the different religions. So I think it's, it's courage that's needed. It's definitely great to do it. Scary stuff, really scary stuff in that. But yeah, that's the only comment I want to make really to say, let's be encouraged. Thank you. Drawing to a close, please. <laughs> uh, we've got two or three minutes. Um, uh, I work as a pioneer minister and I have conversations that feel similar to this quite a lot um, but they're usually with people who say they have no religious affiliation or religious faith uh, but even in saying that it's still quite a defined thing that then they're then saying yeah. about themselves yeah. and what they yeah. believe. Yeah. So the, the similarities are, yeah. <laughs> I think, are quite, quite yeah. uh, significant. Um, but I've been, I've been thinking about the idea. Some people have said about well, what's the practicalness of what you're saying, and obviously that appeals to to me and what I'm doing. Um, <coughs> what keeps coming to mind when I, whenever I talk to people in church about what pioneering is the most common response is, oh, well, I couldn't do that because I wouldn't know what to say. Um, and they present <coughs> as not having the confidence to have a conversation with someone in case they get something wrong or they don't know the answer or whatever, whatever. Mm. Uh, but in listening to what you have been saying tonight, something that's always niggled me about that, I've started to look at slightly differently. But the problem isn't then that they don't have enough confidence is that they've got too much confidence in the thing that they don't know. <laughs> yeah, if only I knew that extra bit of knowledge, then I'd be able to do this. So that's saying something about this openness. Yeah. That it's... I, we shouldn't be teaching people what to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In this field of dialogue. Yeah. Um, it's not a question, but you can say something back at me. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop myself. Uh, yeah, that's what I, I think that's helpful because, um, yeah, quite often people say, I can't do this because I don't know enough, or um, as long as you're confident or rooted yourself enough and, 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 and certain then you can engage. But if we all waited for that bit before we ever engaged, we might never engage. Because you know, well, I need that one more bit of truth as correctness before I can leap out. But actually, um, yeah, Shanks is saying, and uh, I affirm it, that um, faith ultimately is not about the quality of our truth as correctness. It's not know-how. Oh, no, it's, yeah, it's not knowledge. It's not having the right bits of stuff pumped into our heads and hearts. It's about the know-how skill of receptivity. Of how do I go about living as though I believe other people have got a life worth knowing about? Thank you. Thank you, Graham. You have stretched us, yes. made us really think, and sometimes that's so good. Sometimes it really helps to be stretched. And what struck me is both the thoughtfulness of the way in which you've engaged with us, helped us think, but also a, a, a genuine desire to take that depth of understanding and make it real. Uh, which is at the heart of contextual theology in all sorts of ways. So that, that's been so good. Uh, so thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn, for starting us off with mm. the questions and the dialogue and for then taking us further with our questions. Um, join me in appreciation. For <laughs>